get going. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm David Dumkey, the Executive Director of the UCF Office of Global Perspectives and International Initiatives. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, kick off this discussion on the future of U.S. Arab relations uh, with our partners at American University Cairo. Uh, I want to first introduce uh, Kareem Hagag briefly, who is the director, Ambassador Kareem Hagag, I should say, who is the director of the AUC uh, Middle East Studies Center. We will get started uh, momentarily. We're waiting for our provost to give a welcome, and then we will get in, get, get right into the uh, into the into the talk. Thank you. David, why don't you introduce Karim and then we'll go back to the provost when he comes in. Sure, yeah, why, why, don't, why don't we do that? Well, Karim, if you wanna, wanna say a few words, then I'm gonna, I'll have uh, Jonathan Wolf, I'll introduce Jonathan Wolf and let him introduce the speakers and we'll, we'll go back that way. Karim. Karim, you're muted right now. All right. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, David, thank you. And uh, thank you uh, uh, and uh, your team at uh, UCF. Um, we're very happy to be part of this uh, speaker series. And we really hope to probe, I think, some very interesting issues related to uh, the US-Arab relationship. Let me just uh, take this opportunity to also thank uh, Jonathan Wolf uh, for being here really appreciate it. And of course, our, our two very esteemed speakers. So thank you. Great. I, I will, I will uh, interject here a little. Uh, Jonathan Wolf is a, a member of the Central Florida community, one of our, our biggest supporters, and he's also on the AUC Board of Trustees. Uh, Jonathan is a native of North Carolina, a graduate of Georgetown University, and he also attended AUC. Uh, we're we're Pleased with his, his uh, presence here today. We're honored by his, uh, his commitment to us and to working with AUC. So we're gonna go just a little out of order and we're gonna let Jonathan introduce our two speakers who will kick off this discussion. Jonathan. Thanks. Well, thank you, David. And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to join each of you today. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize the folks who put together this outstanding series. Uh, David, your team at Global Perspective and everyone on staff at the Middle East Studies Center. It's really thanks to your time and consideration that today's program uh, brings us this important opportunity. You know, I say important because when it comes to the dynamics between the United States and the 22 countries making up the Arab world, uh, nothing is obvious. And yet as a global citizens for all of us, we have a responsibility, I think, to seek out the nuances, to go past the headlines and learn about the larger story that we're all part of. The challenges we face may be complex, but understanding them is imperative for peace, for prosperity, and for building a future that all of us can share. Today, we're joined by two people who've spent decades building that future. The first is Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. After 34 years of decorated service in the United States Army and 
14 challenging months as the president's national security advisor, General McMaster has been generous in sharing his instincts and his insights. His most recent book, Battlefields, is a tour de force, blending history and memoir, taking us from the front lines in Iraq and Afghanistan to a panorama of the emerging world order. What I admire most about the general is that consistently he seems to rise above politics, even as he speaks truth to power. That mix of integrity and vision makes General McMaster a rare, rare sort of leader. He's a soldier, a scholar, and a policymaker. When he was named one of Time's most influential people a few years back, one of his colleagues called him the 21st century Army's preeminent warrior thinker. Now, I don't think I can top that, but I can tell you a bit about our second speaker today. When I first met Ambassador Fahmi, my wife Nancy and I were both struck by his sense of purpose, his personal commitment to public service. Serving as Egypt's ambassador to Japan, the US, and then as foreign minister during a national crisis, Ambassador Fahmi masterfully represented Egypt's national interests. At the same time, he was somebody clearly working for the betterment of humankind. Now, I realize that sounds grand, but when you hear him speak about nuclear nonproliferation or Arab-Israeli diplomacy, you get something more than a foreign policy expert. You get a sense of what's possible when people work together respectively and in good faith. In this way, as presidents, prime ministers, and now his students at the American University in Cairo will tell you, Ambassador Fahmi leads by example. So just let me say to each of you, welcome, uh, General, Ambassador, thank you for your time. It's a privilege to have you with us today. And I think I speak for everyone here when I say, we're interested to get your perspectives on what the future holds. And so now, um, Ambassador Hagag, Ahlan Sahlan, and uh, lead us off. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, okay, if we could turn to our two uh, distinguished speakers, uh, starting with General McMaster, uh, followed by uh, Minister Fahmi. Uh, General McMaster, uh, you have 25 minutes. Great. Hey, great. Well, it, well, first of all, thanks to all of you for the great privilege of being with you, Mr. Wolf. Thanks for the kind introduction. Ambassador Hagag and Professor Dunkey, uh, it's, it's, just great. it's great to be with, with all of you, and especially to be with Ambassador Fahmi, a, a real expert on the Middle East. I, I would consider myself a student of the Middle East, and, and, uh, and so I, I'm really looking forward to, to, to Ambassador Fahmi's comments more than, uh, uh, more, more than <laughs> I think we'll learn more from him that I'll be able to impart today. Uh, I, want to, I want to especially thank Ambassador Fahmi and, and all of our Egyptian friends for uh, the foundational role, the important role that, that Egypt just played in mediating in a ceasefire uh, between uh, Israel and, and Hamas uh, most recently. Uh, it was a, a great, I think, contribution uh, to humanity and saved a lot of, of human suffering. And, and hopefully it can be, begin the beginning of, of, of uh, progress toward a more stable situation, at least. Uh, in that particular problem, with regards to that particular problem set, you know, I, I have this great privilege of of sitting in in the chair named for one of my mentors and professors and someone about from whom I learned a lot about the Middle East, and this is Fawad Ajami, and he he he, he one of his so many great quotations, right? That we could that we could that we could use uh, to to start uh, to start this session, but but one of those that that I think is worth noting is he once observed that talking about the Middle East, it is not a fast part of the world, right? And this is why I think Americans oftentimes uh, have a difficult time uh, understanding and, and even thinking about the, the Middle East, because we tend to be prone toward wanting you know, quick solutions to, to, to problems and uh, or, or, or to take advantage of opportunities. And the Middle East is just not conducive to that kind of mindset. So I'll talk really about the situation the Biden administration confronts and maybe the outlines of what an effective policy might be toward the Middle East, but uh, you know the the Biden administration, of course, you know faces a, a confounding and wretched situation across the Greater Middle East, and this is what I would describe as the region spanning Morocco in the west to Iran in the east and encompassing the northern countries of Syria and Iraq to the southern countries of Sudan and Yemen. Uh, over the past two decades, 
the inability of the United States to pursue a consistent policy in cooperation with like-minded nations, I think has contributed to the scale and duration of the catastrophe there and diminished American influence. The policies of the George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump administrations were consistent, I think, with America's tendency to pursue again, short-term solutions to long-term problems. Many Americans view the region mainly as, as a mess to be avoided. But there are three reasons I'd like to highlight why disengagement from the Middle East would make a bad situation worse with implications for Americans as well, of, of course, uh, for, for the peoples uh, of the region. So the fir first, first problems in, in the region do not remain confined there. Jihadist terrorist organizations are, I believe, orders of magnitude larger than the Mujahideen alumni from the Soviet-Afghan war, and their reach and capabilities are growing. Second, the costs of inaction in the region are often higher than the costs of action. The George W. Bush administration's 2003 invasion of Iraq may have been ill-considered, but so was the Barack Obama administration's withdrawal from Iraq in December 2011. Many disremember how the Obama administration's effort to avoid what it perceived as its predecessor's mistakes in Iraq actually surpassed them with a NATO campaign that contributed to Muammar Gaddafi's demise, but did nothing to shape the political environment that followed. It is clear that the decision in 2013 not to enforce a previously announced red line in Syria, this is of course after the Assad regime used chemical weapons to murder nearly 1,400 people, including over 400 children, removed re remaining checks on the region's brutality and emboldened the Assad regime sponsors, Russia and Iran. The worst humanitarian crisis since World War II it centered on the Syrian civil war, has overburdened neighboring states of Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, and extended into Europe. And then third, the Middle East has always been and will remain an arena for competitions that have consequences far beyond its geographic expanse. Some argue that the United States should disengage from the Middle East to free up assets for great power competition with Russia and China, but competitions with those countries are ongoing in the region. China is expanding economic relationships with UAE and other countries. Re other countries also recently entered a strategic uh, agreement uh, with, uh, with, with Iran. Uh, this is what China's done, obviously, uh, and, and Russia has a strong relationship with Iran. And I think it's worth noting that, 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 uh, that while Iranian-supported Houthis uh, controlled the north side, uh, the portion of the north side of the Bab el-Mandeb, that China, with a base in Djibouti, uh, on the south side of, of the Bab el Mandeb, uh, allow would allow uh, this this partnership uh, to control one of the world's most important strategic waterways. And if you have doubts about that, just look at the traffic jam uh, of ships that that followed the the temporary closure uh, of the Suez Canal just a couple of months ago. I think it's also important to note that that Russia and Iran uh, aid, abet, and sustain the murderous Assad regime, regime in, in, in Syria and enable you know, the serial episodes of mass homicide that is the Syrian civil war. Russia has used you know, the crises in the region as a way, I think, to weaken Europe and, and to present the Kremlin as the arbiter of a conflict that it is perpetuating. We could talk more about this. I like to call this Putin's Potemkin peace plan uh, for, the, for the Middle East, uh, which allows them uh, to play the role both of arsonist uh, and firemen in, in the region. Iran, of course, uses chaos to its strategic advantage. Iran's strategy, I believe, is to keep the Arab world perpetually weak and enmeshed in sectarian conflict, while its proxies extend Iranian influence to the Mediterranean Sea, Red Sea, and the borders of Israel. While recognizing the limits of its influence in the region, the United States should galvanize a long-term multinational diplomatic, military, and development effort to arrest the cycle of sectarian violence that is strengthening jihadist terrorist organizations, extending Iran's influence, 
perpetuating state weakness and inflicting human suffering on a colossal scale. Diplomatic efforts should pursue resolution of the civil wars in Syria, Libya, and Yemen, consistent with the UN political process, curtail Iranian influence in the region, and galvanize assistance for refugees and international funding for reconstruction. Long-term diplomatic engagement is necessary to strengthen groups that can contribute to enduring political settlements, forge accommodations across sectarian, ethnic, and tribal divides, combat extremist ideology, resist Iranian subversion, and undertake the range of intelligence, law enforcement, and military efforts necessary to prevent terrorists from threatening the United States uh, and our interests abroad. Diplomacy should encourage like-minded partners to impose costs on Tehran and Moscow for perpetuating violence and insecurity. For example, it is difficult to imagine how Turkish leaders could continue cooperation with Russia and Iran after the losses of Turkish soldiers in Syria and the clash of Russian and Turkish proxy forces in, in, in Libya and also in Nagorno-Karabakh. The, the looming crisis in, in Ukraine should highlight further the degree to which Russian and Turkish interests are divergent. Military efforts in the Middle East should reduce the centripetal forces that are perpetuating violence and preventing political resolution of conflicts. Very small U.S. forces enable partners to combat terrorists and counter Iranian proxies. Beyond sustained efforts to deny jihadist terrorist bases of operation, U.S. forces alongside partners in the region must remain prepared to impose costs on Iran should its leaders intensify its four-decade-long proxy war to drive the United States out of the region, threaten Israel, and keep the Arab world in perpetual conflict. Development efforts should encourage reforms that strengthen governance, rule of law, and democratic institutions and processes. The breakdown of order in the Middle East is in large measure the result of serial failures of colonial rule, post-colonial monarchies, Arab nationalism, socialist dictatorships, and Islamist extremism. Decades of conflict fragmented societies along ethnic, sectarian, and tribal lines. From Beirut to Baghdad to Tehran, people, though, are demanding reform. The United States and other nations should support them. Governments responsive to the demands of their people are able to counter corruption and remove significant barriers to the economic growth that is necessary to recover from the COVID-19 recession and provide jobs in a region that has possessed the highest youth unemployment rate for the past 25 years. So I, mean, I guess all this is to say, hey, there are no short-term solutions to the Middle East long-term problems. Progress in breaking the cycle of sectarian violence and overcoming the region's problems will be slow and uneven. There will be setbacks. The halting progress and frequent disappointments in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process across the past three decades is just one case in point. But U.S. disengagement from the Middle East would neither conciliate the region's violent passions nor insulate America from them. A long-term strategy that integrates diplomatic, military, and, de dipl and, and development efforts to break the cycle of sectarian violence in the region and incentivize necessary reforms is the best way to improve security and promote prosperity for the people in the Middle East and the world. The recent Abraham Accords between initially UAE and Bahrain and later Sudan and, and Morocco are promising because they could, over time, help arrest the cycle of sectarian violence in the region. The name, of course, is powerful because it emphasizes our common humanity and it communicates that the people of the book should isolate extremists from, from sources of, of ideological support and recognize that jihadist terrorists use a perverted interpretation of religion to justify violence against innocents for political purposes. And what we need and what we should celebrate, I think, about the Abraham Accords is there can be practical cooperation 
uh, the Accords you know, acknowledge the role that Iran plays in perpetuating the cycle of sectarian violence while threatening Israel uh, and, and, and its Arab neighbors. So finally, a few words on Iran in light of, of, the, of the recent events in connection with Iran. Uh, for example, the attack on the nuclear center of Uges in Tants. I think it's important to place that event and the Biden administration's efforts to negotiate a new nuclear deal in context. For decades, American policies toward Iran have produced disappointing results due in part to a lack of appreciation for the ideology that drives Iran's theocratic dictatorship. Conciliatory approaches toward Iran across multiple administrations have suffered from a lack of what I would call, as a term I borrow from Zach, the historian Zachary Shore, strategic empathy. The Iranian nuclear deal, called the JCPOA, is a paragon of what I would call strategic narcissism. President Obama had hoped that relaxing, re relaxing sanctions on Iran would convince Iran not only to give up its nuclear program, but also to focus more on the economy and its people. His administration, like other administrations, hoped that the Islamic Republic, once welcomed into the international community, would halt its four-decade-long proxy war and eventually evolve into a force for stability in the Middle East. The belief that sanctions relief would change not only the behavior, but also the very nature of the regime was based on the narcissistic assumption that U.S. actions were the principal source of Iranian attitudes and behaviors. An understanding of two factors that drive and constrain Iranian leadership is essential to overcome decades of disappointing results from Washington's conciliatory approach toward Iran. First, since 1979, the regime has been driven by the ideology of the revolution, an ideology that is fundamentally hostile to the great Satan, the United States, the little Satan, Israel, and others, including Arab, its Arab neighbors and the West generally. The forthcoming elections in Iran, elections in which candidates run uh, only if they express their willingness to support that ideology, uh, it, it, th th those elections are likely to strengthen the hand of revolutionaries over what some call the Republicans in Iran. Second, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and the, and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the, the military organization charged with preserving the revolution, they want to achieve hegemonic influence across the Middle East. Accomplishing that goal requires driving the United States out of the region. And if you just consider a short highlight reel from Iran's proxy war against the United States, this becomes apparent. So the, the regime's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps gets away with murder, uh, due not only to its unscrupulousness and its talent for deception, but the mistaken belief across multiple U.S. administrations that the Iranian regime will respond positively to a conciliatory approach. But when Iran has moderated its behavior, it did so in response to intense political, economic, and military pressure. So the United States, I believe, should work with like-minded partners in four areas to force the Iranian regime to choose between continuing their murderous proxy wars or behaving like a responsible nation. I'll just hit the highlights here. First, until the regime end, ends its hostility and its support for terrorists and proxy forces, the United States and its partners must improve defenses against Iranian military and terrorist capabilities. Second, disrupting and ultimately blocking Iran's path to a nuclear weapon must remain a top priority, but not with a weak, flawed agreement like the JCPOA. Third, impose physical and financial costs on Iran to reduce resources available to wage its proxy wars across the Middle East and beyond. And fourth, circumvent the regime's restrictions to communicate with the Iranian people, expose the regime's corruption, and reinforce already strong popular sentiment for a change in the nature of the corrupt mafia-like dictatorship that steals and squanders their nation's wealth while denying people fundamental rights. So although the Iranian regime has proven consistently hostile and the revolutionaries are ascendant, the Iranian regime is not a monolith. And so I think there are opportunities, I think, to put in place an effective and sustained approach to the Middle East and to the problems that associate it with the Iranian regime. And finally, I'll just say the U.S. approach to the Middle East and Iran should recognize, obviously, the limitations of our influence over the future course of events. We should recognize that the U.S. did not cause the problems in the Middle East and can and also cannot solve the problems in the Middle East. But the United States can play a constructive role alongside like-minded partners like Egypt uh, to help break the cycle of sectarian violence and help the region move toward uh, uh, move along a path 
of sustainable security, stability, uh, economic growth, and development. Hey, th thank you, and I really look forward to to to, to hearing from Ambassador Fahmi. Uh, General, uh, thank you. Uh, you've given us a very uh, compelling case for continued U.S. engagement uh, with the region. And in doing so, you laid a broad uh, agenda uh, for us uh, that I'm sure would be the subject for a very interesting conversation. Um, before proceeding uh, to go with uh, Minister Fahmi, I realize uh, that uh, the U UCF Provost, uh, Mr. Michael Johnson, is here with us. He's joined us. And if I could pass the mic to him uh, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Mr. Agag. It's my great pleasure on behalf of the University of Central Florida and our friends at the American University in Cairo to welcome everyone who's in attendance today. And it's my honor on behalf of the university to welcome our two extremely accomplished speakers today, General McMaster, whose knowledgeable analysis we just heard, and Foreign Minister Fami. We hope that today's discussion and those to follow contribute to the debate about where we collectively are headed. The world has changed a great deal in the past few decades, and the policies shaping US relations with the region and the regions with the United States must adapt. Too often, the debate about strategic concerns in the Middle East and North Africa has, at least from the American side, been confined to the Washington Beltway, when in fact there are many voices across the nation eager to participate, and we hope that today's session helps this effort. For those of you who don't know, the University of Central Florida is one of the largest and most innovative universities in the United States. It is an honor for us to partner with the American University in Cairo, one of the most prestigious universities in the region. And I want to thank Jonathan and Nancy Wolf for their generous support facilitating this partnership. You are making a real difference. And I also wanna thank Bobby and Julie Mandel for their continued support of UCF's global perspectives. We look forward to holding future discussions live in Orlando and in Cairo. Thank you again for your participation. And now back to the program. Thank you, Provost Johnson. Uh, very much appreciate uh, you being here with us. Um, if I could turn to Minister Fahmi. Minister Fahmi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karim. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. First of all, let me thank let me thank USC for the kind invitation to come on to your event. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to uh, educated audiences, and I have to say, whenever USC does stuff with us at the American University in Cairo, it is really at a very high standard. Uh, so my my appreciation to Provost Johnson, my appreciation, of course, to David Dunkey, who we go back uh, quite a while, and of course to uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wolf, who have been uh, so supportive of this cooperation. Uh, I would want to add also that uh, I thank Jonathan very much for his kind introduction uh, in my respect, but I would like to simply uh, concur that I think everything he said about the general is uh, true to the point. I've read uh, much about him and followed a lot of his work. And frankly, the presentation he gave uh, today was really something commendable and uh, uh, I think it would be very useful as we move forward. So general, I'm happy to be on this event with you. Let me try to address the issue from uh, the, if you want, the Mediterranean, Middle Eastern Arab perspective. The basic topic we were asked to address uh, is what's the future about American Arab relations? And having, I mean, yes, I am born in America, I was born in New York, but I'm not American. Uh, I've lived 40% oh, of my life in America in different capacities but I'm passionately Egyptian and I've served the Egyptian government per se. So I've had an earful of complaints from both sides, uh, either because we can do more or because we would do something wrong, but it's natural. I think that's quite natural because we are both very important 
uh, players in our theater of operations. We uh, both tend to be activists, even if we every now and then uh, play down our role. Uh, and if I would argue that all the complaints that exist, we are indispensable to each other. Ups and downs, but we are just indispensable to each other. And I say this because the US is a global power. Whether it wants to be a superpower or not, it's its choice. But I like to, to uh, describe it as a global power because you will have it all over the world. Your policies may change and therefore your priorities may change. But in the long term, you have interests all over the world. So you cannot literally withdraw from all over the world all the time. Uh, there, therefore, it's extremely important for you to understand the general content of uh, different areas and also the details as the general was uh, mentioning in, uh, so eloquently. Uh, I would add to that, that the Arab world from the Maghreb Arabi from Mauritania and Morocco, right through Egypt in North Africa to the Levant and then down to the Gulf. It's over two continents, uh, touches on two oceans, several seas. Uh, so the idea that uh, you don't engage the world or that you want to love or hate a major power is amateurish and childish. It serves our interest to have a well-managed relationship with the major powers, particularly major powers that we have more in agreement with than we have in disagreement with. One of the uh, things that uh, I've listened to frequently is the, and has surprised me, the lack of understanding of why the other side is doing whatever it is doing, assuming that we had to do things in the same way, which was always quite amusing to me. But I also was always disappointed with that because we may have differences, people ignored how much we have in common. And I'll get to that in a second. But we are both going through a delicate stage. I mean, I think America is going through its own identity crisis, what it wants to be looking forward. Uh, and if you look at the uh, different characters of the different American presidents uh, over the last 15, 20 years, that's an indication of that. It's not yet the answer, but it's an indication. If you look at the demography inside America, that's also an indication. But frankly, America has to be changing because the world is changing also. And uh, if you look at the number of revolutions we've had in the Arab world over the last 10 years, and you look at the percentage of youth in the Arab world versus the percentage of people who are, are my age, you have to assume it's a changing world as well. And our future will be determined probably by people who think differently from the way I think. I just want to get to the point where they can make their own decisions rationally and uh, based on a strategic outlook rather than on a tactical one. So when you have this period of global flux and period of internal inflection, it, it complicates the, the process of how do we deal with each other. But let's move a bit forth more quickly. Uh, traditionally, America has been interested in the Middle East for two reasons. One, the posture within the Cold War, superpower competition. That's mostly over, at least versus Russia. It's not going to be the same kind of competitor as it was in the past. It can be an annoying factor, but that's something else. So the Middle East per se, as part of the global theater, is less urgent for America. The second point is the overfocus on energy. America, huge, strong, positive economy, needed energy. And the Middle East was providing much more energy than it was providing in terms of actually products that we, we fabricate, that we produce together. So there was this energy factor. And now that dependence on Middle Eastern energy is highly decreased. American interest in Middle Eastern energy now relates to the price of the market much more than its personal need per se. Uh, I, let me add to that the last post-Iraq, if you want. America is going through a 
and, and General, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, my sense of following Americans is that they're going through a period of operational fatigue. They're not comfortable getting into strong operations again, even if they're right, even if, they're, if they should do that, or if they don't, that's a debate for Americans. But with these three dimensions, they look at the Middle East and they see conflict all over the place. And the first reaction is, I'm gonna leave this area. Well, that's not a very logical reaction because first of all, the worst thing to do, you can do is declare something which you can't do. Declare wrong policy, but be able to do it. To declare a wrong policy, which you can't do, makes it even worse for everybody. But I would add also, we have our problems in the region. In light of the three elements I, just, I, I put in as American, as parts of the American thinking, more and more the Middle East is becoming regionalized. It's more a function of its own problems, of its own competitions, of its own balance, imbalance of power, uh, be that economic or military. And I would argue that the American security uh, support, let me, let me rephrase that, foreign security support, because it started in areas with the Soviet Union and then it went to America, I'm talking particularly about my country, but then it was mostly uh, in the West in uh, other countries, including in, in, in my own country. The over-dependence on foreigners for national security capacity, here the focus is Arab world, basically made us too relaxed in dealing with our immediate regional problems. Therefore, if the superpowers are less interested in the region, our, the imbalance regionally creates insecurity and creates uh, an incentive for hegemony by some powers. And I would argue here, and I have not uh, coordinated this with the general, uh, the Iranian and Turkish appetite for influence in the region would not have been as large as it is today if it didn't feel that it had political, had political and military power more than the Arab countries there, because it's quite logical that the major powers are not going to fight every battle. They will come in for existential battles. So that was a mistake we did in the Arab world. We should have developed relations with, with America, with the West, with others, but at the same time, continue to develop our own national security capacity. And I'm not only talking here about weapons. I'm talking security capacity, military and political. Uh, let me add here that because of that, you're going to, the, the Arab world feels insecure. It knows it's not up to the standard yet by international standards, by regional standards. And it knows that America does not want to engage as strongly as it has in the past. Uh, so it's going to have to buy time as it grows. And because it doesn't know where America is going to end up being, it's going to look around for other friends. There's nobody who can play America's role in the next 10 years. They're not going to find anybody out there who can play that. Well, the Russians can't play the role. The Chinese won't be able to play the security role. But look at the Gulf, the closest region to America in terms of security. The Arab Gulf Chinese investments are the fastest growing in the whole region. But if you look at the Maghreb Arab in Morocco, you also see a very strong trend of increased Chinese influence. So again, we're going to face circumstances where uh, we were not prepared for in the past. And we're going to have to make some quick questions, quick decisions to deal with pressing problems. Um, but the problem is our the solutions to our problems won't be there in the short term. No matter how many weapons we buy, I'm talking about those with a smaller army. Egypt has a strong army. That's not really the debate here. But if you're looking at the, the Arab Gulf area, they can buy all the weapons they want and legitimately so. But for them to have the, the, the cadres to be able to carry that into battle, it's going to require a significant amount of time. Uh, so we're both looking here, uh, where do we go in the future? We're both concerned about 
uh, what the future would look like. Uh, in my book, I mentioned that uh, the two main problems in the Arab world have been an overdependence on foreigners in national security issues and a generic resistance to change. Anything that's different, we start off by saying no to and then look into because we have to. Uh, I say this as a passionate Arab. I'm not, uh, this is not by way of criticism, it's by way of admission. Uh, the only thing that's assured is that change will happen. So right, if you don't embrace it, prepare for it and build on it, you end up running after it and it becomes, becomes a problem. Let me be a bit more specific uh, because uh, the general has set a very high standard uh, in, in that respect. If you look at the, the Arab world, Maghreb Arab, many of you will not know, but the first Arab country to recognize America was Morocco. I didn't even know that except a couple of years ago when I was had time to read some books, uh, frankly. Uh, and Morocco will always be pro-West, will always preserve a place for America in its uh, paradigm. But they are more and more European oriented. And in the balance of things, Morocco is not that prominent in the, Amer in the American mindset of national security on the global level. If you look at what I just mentioned a minute ago, if you look at the increased Chinese influence in Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, and even growing in Tunis, particularly with the building of port facilities or engaging in that, I don't think the, the Chinese have the same national security appetite that America has had for many, many years. Uh, they're slow in digesting that part of the, of the, of the debate. But over time, the idea that their economic appetite is separate from their security appetite is also frankly not realistic. So you're going to see more of a security dimension that will become more important to America in North Africa over the next uh, decade or so, and not necessarily only from so this is the Russians. If you look at Libya, Libya has never really been a major interest to uh, America, more towards Europe. But the Americans played a very good role in getting where the getting the Libyans to go where they are uh, presently. Uh, a lot of it was done in cooperation with with us here in Egypt. And oh, before I forget, uh, General, thank you for your kind comments about the recent activities in, in Gaza. I'll get back to that, and uh, I look forward to more cooperation with America on on that respect. Uh, on Libya, the American posture there, as we read it, as I read it, let me be careful here, is one, it sees an opportunity to help fix something. Two, if it does so, and you create an, a centrist environment there with your friends, be they in Tunis or in Egypt, uh, you also preempt a little bit the Russian appetite to gain much more stature in Libya. The Russians are there in every different kind of color you want. Um, and I think they're getting in a bit way over their heads, but if they see a vacuum there, if they don't see the America there, and with the, with the Europeans being what they are, the Russians will increase their appetite. Uh, Libya and Egypt, as I said, uh, America's interest in Libya is mostly about Russia. The Libyan interest in America, I mean, Libya is, is a, is a Bit of an odd case because Gaddafi did one thing well. He destroyed all elements of governance that exist. So when he disappeared, it's been very difficult to put the system back together. I think what's happened so far the last couple of the last year or so was almost a miracle, but it's not yet sustained. So we need to help the, the uh, Libyans establish institutions of government. Uh, and by the way, uh, Egypt and our university in particular is going to do some work on that. Uh, but our cooperation with America on Libya is a win-win-win situation because it will help the Libyans, it will help America, and it will also help Egypt tremendously because of the major security problem we face when that border breaks down uh, and it is truly a, a problem. I think we both agree as do, as do most of the Libyans, 
that getting foreign forces out of Libya is one of the primary objectives we should all be uh, pursuing. Uh, Egypt per se, I mean, uh, to cut a long story short, the Egyptian-American relationship in my mind is an indispensable relationship that every now and then is uncomfortable. Uncomfortable for two reasons. One, Americans believe in American exceptionalism. And we believe that we're the mother of the world. Uh, so you have this huge ego factor. Uh, our relationship is really between two major countries, one global and one regional, uh, that think differently but want the same thing. Uh, I tell my Egyptian colleagues, and I think this is important for uh, America to keep in mind, and the general made an excellent point about this, you have influence in different areas where you're active, not only in terms of security and aid, but yes, also in terms of security and aid. But there's a tendency every now and then to believe that because you're providing security and you're providing aid, then people have to be subordinates. And that doesn't work. And I would argue with my own colleagues that Egyptians live on two seas and actually extend into two continents, our own country as well as in Asia and in Africa. So the idea that we could have a reactive foreign policy or not engage is a non-starter. Many of my colleagues ask, why are you guys so engaged all the time? I import investment, I import food, I import national security capacity, and up until five years ago, I imported energy as well. How can I not have a proactive foreign policy? And if I'm going to do that, how can I not have a well-managed relations with the US? Whether I agree with the US on everything or not, I don't have to, and they don't have to, but we need to engage each other uh, well. And uh, it's for that reason that I repeatedly say it is an indispensable relationship, even if it's uncomfortable because each of us looks at themselves uh, in a particular way. I've shied away from describing it as a strategic relationship, not because it isn't, but because it doesn't fall into the typical bracket of what defines strategic relationships in terms of, if you want, uh, um, common ideas and stuff like that. But I definitely believe it's a relationship based on strategic needs. Egyptians need America. I cannot do what I do in terms of my growth factors, my security factors, my political role factors, my influence in the region. If I cannot depend on the major powers and particularly America to help come in and do these things. And again, the example that the, uh, the general just mentioned, and there are others, war and peace in the past and, and all that. Uh, we were the first in gas and the first in Israel with the recent outbreaks. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, that you could have resolved, anybody could resolve it without our role. But frankly, having America come in to close things was also important. The same applied to, by the way, when we started the peace process back in the 70s. We went to war and we started the peace process, but we wouldn't have been able to close it without America uh, in, in that particular time, President Carter uh, coming in to try to uh, butt heads together. Uh, we may have different perceptions of how the world should be run, and there will be differences, by the way. Uh, but the reality is, if you look at in, in simple terms, what is the strongest component of our relationship? The gentleman sitting on the panel with the military. The military and the security elements are the strongest component of the Egypt-American relation. Up and down, when people like me get into sidetracking arguments, these guys come back and say, well, we need that other side there. Because they look at, if you want, the strategic needs, not only the strategic talk that we do. So it's going to survive, and it can build quite strongly looking forward. I would argue also that even politically, 
We want the same thing, even if we divide it differently. America wants a centrist, moderate Middle East. Egypt wants a centrist, moderate, moderate Middle East. Even if we have a different definition of centrist and moderate, we still, in comparison to others, want a lot of commonality here. We both want to support peace and stability in the Middle East, even if we differ. And I've had endless arguments with my American colleagues about some details of the peace process. But if we differ on the gray area, that says a lot more than differing on the substance of trying to achieve peace and stability. So there's a lot more there of commonality. I've spent a lot of time on Egypt. I'm gonna close with two or three more minutes, but I do that not only because I'm Egyptian and that's my nature, but also because we're a quarter of the Middle East. So in essence, if we're talking about the Arab world, a quarter of it lives in, in Egypt per se. But let me move to the Levant, uh, Jordan, Iraq, and, and Palestine and the Gulf. Look, you've tended to be, after the invasion of Iraq, you've tended to be a bit in, in unfocused about what you actually want to do in the Levant. You're still there in Iraq. It's not exactly clear what you're trying to do or not do, how much you're ready to engage in uh, Syria and the Levant. The Russians are, the Russians and the Turks are taking advantage of that, as are, by the way, the Iranians. Um, the Syrians don't feel pressure to take decisions because there's only so much the Russians can do and the Russians don't want to do more than that. And there's no really incentive uh, for them to, to, to uh, look at other options. And in all honesty, I don't think the present Syrian regime is ready to look at other options. It's in an existential uh, status. I think Palestine Jordan is something you guys need to look at very seriously. Uh, resolving the Palestinian issue would provide security that serves the Arab world and serves America very significantly in, in the Levant. Uh, the absence of that actually risks both Jordan and Palestine, uh, which ultimately also affects Israel. Uh, I'm just focusing on the Arab world per se. I would happy that Secretary Blinken was here yesterday. Uh, I'm happy we have a ceasefire. Ceasefires only survive until the next bullet. So we have a ceasefire, that's what we start off with. But then we need to engage in a peace process, which provides, uh, which diffuses the situation, provides uh, equal rights for Israelis and, and, and Palestinians and uh, stability throughout the region, including ultimately, of course, this goes back, people don't know this, but the first to actually suggest normal relations between Israel and the Arab world was Egypt in 1977. Even Egyptians were surprised when we did that. But of course we did that as a result of peace, not as a step towards peace. Uh, but the fact is the Arab summit said it in 2002, let's end occupation and have normal relations with each other. Uh, and frankly, if we, I don't believe you can have normal relations without peace but I'm ready to try anything that moves forward. But let's try to move the different things forward uh, because peace is of tremendous interest uh, of the, uh, in the Arab world. It helps us against extremism. I'm not talking here only about Palestine-Israel peace, but that is a large component. I need to build the mindset in my own region. To do that, I need to push it more towards centrism. I need to push it consequently more towards hope than towards uh, anger and frustration. I need to provide tangible answers to today's generation that is growing up looking at the future. Because if I can't do that, they will end up listening to people who promise them things that will never happen and want, promising them only to get revenge rather than to build uh, their own future. Uh, let me stop with those points and simply conclude with one point. I honestly believe that the Arab world is presently with its, with its use factor, really fertile ground for America using its soft power to complement its hard power. You can't do one versus the other. Uh, we will continue to depend on you in dealing with extremism uh, and 
hegemonic states. Uh, I was just on a Zoom event, and then I will close Zoom, just Zoom event just before this on the JCPOA specifically. And I made the comment then that I wasn't an enthusiast for the JCPOA when it was signed. Uh, and I had talked to John Kerry about this as a minister. I did not think that withdrawing from JCPOA was the smartest thing to do, but leaving it as it is wouldn't have been smart either. My approach would be ask for more, put more pressure, try to get more of it. But we are where we are now. We cannot ignore the security problems that exist uh, and we shouldn't deal with them. And this is my main problem with JCPOA. JCPOA seems to be drafted as a concern of Iranian threats to the five plus one powers that are out there. Even if Iran was to have nuclear weapons, and it shouldn't, its main threat will not be the five plus one out there. It may it will be the region. So how can you have a JCPOA that did not have a regional component uh, was a bit of a surprise for me. Anyway, let me stop with that. We'll give you more chance to ask questions. Uh, but again, thank you to all who organized this. And General, I'm honored to be on the panel with you. Um, Minister Fahmy, uh, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive and very rich uh, overview. Um, I was really struck by the degree of convergence between your presentation and what uh, General McMaster uh, uh, argued uh, in his presentation. Um, you, you made the case of, you described uh, the relationship between the United States and the Arab world as indispensable and focusing in particular on Egypt. Uh, General McMaster made a very compelling argument that there are costs for uh, or as a result of disengagement, uh, the US disengagement uh, with the region, there are costs for the region and there are costs for the United States. And I think that convergence uh, sets up our conversation here uh, quite nicely. You know, wh when uh, David and I started conceiving of this project, we realized that there was a time when we can actually talk about something called the US-Arab relationship. I mean, for the United States, America did have at one point something it called its Arab policy, e even if it was a subset of its overall Middle East policy. And that focused on energy, that focused on regional security cooperation, and it focused on a real convergence on the need for uh, serious Arab-Israeli diplomacy. Uh, uh, that we used to call the peace process. Um, and the same with uh, the Arab world, even if there was no formal Arab consensus on what uh, the Arab world wanted from the United States, uh, there was an unspoken alignment about what uh, the Arab countries needed uh, from the United States that focused on these are three or four uh, key issues. So if I could really start with a pointed, but I think very fundamental question to both of you gentlemen. Today, after everything that's changed, and you describe, both describe the changes quite well, we're, we're in a different region, uh, the United States has changed, the Arab world has changed. Given all of these changes today, what do both sides actually want from each other? For Minister Fahmy, what, what does the Arab world want from the United States to achieve, uh, as you described, a more centrist, moderate Middle East? And for the general, when America looks to the region, what does the United States want from the Arab world? If I could start with Minister Fahmy first. I would have liked you to start with the general first to give me some more time to think about that. But anyway, let me, let me answer the question. Uh, and, I, and Karim, you know me, I tend to be extremely blunt, even uh, paying a price for that. Uh, but in the general's presence, that'll be quite uh, modest. Uh, I actually think the Arabs don't know what they want. They want a repeat of history, and that's wrong. Because history is not going to repeat itself as it is today. The Arabs want American security, they want American support, they want to 
feel that America is there in, and they want an American dependency, frankly, on them. None of the three is going to happen. Uh, and let me answer quickly by saying this region is becoming more regionalized. So the role of a superpower will always be there, but it's not going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. When America engaged to help to counter Iran, it engaged to counter Iran when it threatened maritime security or attacked US bases in Iraq. It did not engage uh, Iran to free these, the islands it occupies from the Emirates. When over the next decade, you're going to see an emergence of China in the Gulf, for example, and in Egypt and among other, uh, uh, other areas as well. According to the present American administration, the past one as well, and I'm sure the future one, China is the new competitor. So you're going to find it there. How do we as Arabs balance out our interest with America? What do we ask for America to counter the Chinese uh, entry? Frankly, if we ask the same thing, we're not going to get it. I would argue also, I, and this is my opinion, I think we should be less dependent on America, but I think we should better invest the American investment in, in, in the region. In other words, I don't want America to fight my fight. I don't want America to build my buildings, but I want America to help me do a better job of helping myself. I would love to see America help in regional capacity building in creating more synergies between Arab countries. Uh, I would love to see America uh, not only talk the normative talk, but also actually walk the normative walk. Or let's talk real politique and let's just focus on that because the worst problem is you assume something or you assume it's not reality, but it turns out to be reality. And while a major power can afford to do that, smaller countries pay the price if they miss calculate. Uh, so I would argue, I just, I'd like, you know, you know, my last point is the following. Even today with all of the tension in the region and the critique to America every now and then, even in friendly countries like Egypt, the number of people walking the sidewalk in front of the American embassy to get a visa still grows. Why is that? Because people want to, if you want, their image of America is essentially good until proven otherwise. They would like to see America be the image of the good. Uh, real politique will create some problems here. But I really believe, especially with a youthful demography, America can be uh, something that people want to emulate in their own clothes. I don't want to be an American. I want to be a better Egyptian and a better Egyptian would be more centrist as which is common with what America wants. So my long answer is help me be better in what I do. So I'll just add, I'll just add to that by saying, I think first of all, there is a humanitarian catastrophe ongoing in the greater Middle East. I think US interests begin with, with, with really addressing the humanitarian crisis uh, but of course, it's impossible to do that only with, you know, with aid uh, to refugee camps uh, and, and, to, and through the UN uh, in, 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 in uh, Lebanon and, and in Jordan uh, and in, in Turkey. Um, and it, it has to go to the political drivers of this conflict. And, and that is really, in essence, a sectarian civil war and a cycle of violence associated with that sectarian civil war that involves an interaction between Iranian support and militias, uh, and and uh, and and Arab communities uh, that fear evisceration at the hands of, of those militias, and therefore tend then to regard even some of the worst jihadist terrorist organizations as patrons and, and protectors of their beleaguered communities. And so the so the the, the arresting uh, the cycle of sectarian violence uh, by weakening uh, Iranian proxies and and, and, uh, and, and isolating jihadist terrorists from sources of support uh, is immensely important. I think it's important to, 
to to address this in the short term uh, with policies that that weaken the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and their proxies by limiting the amount of funds and resources they have available to them. For example, uh, it's important to undertake you know, short term efforts to to operate against uh, terrorist organization leadership as ongoing operations in Syria and Iraq that are enabled by U.S. small numbers of U.S. special forces against uh, against what's left of of, uh, of ISIS, uh, for example, in those portions of the you know the of that uh, that territory that is important psychologically and and uh, and strategically for uh, for jihadist ter terrorist organizations. That's important, but really in the long term. I think of it as a cycle of of ignorance, uh, hatred, and violence, and and these groups that that uh, that are I think really the enemies of all civilized people uh, use ignorance to foment hatred and hatred uh, to justify violence against innocents. And of course, who are those innocents? Well, the vast majority of them are our fellow Muslims who they murder, uh, and and so it's important I think to undertake support you know for for long term efforts in education. Um, and then to recognize, you know, that that the, that these that the violence in the region isn't conducive, obviously, to people getting educated, and and as you pack uh, refugees into these camps, uh, it actually these camps are oftentimes the best recruiting grounds for jihadist terrorist organizations. So, I mean, what what do we care about? I think it's it's really addressing the short term dangers associated with the cycle of sectarian violence and the threat from jihadist terrorists, which we know don't remain confined to that particular region. But also to take a long-term approach in connection with support for development efforts, and then this is where I would love to hear from the ambassador as well. I think this includes political reforms also, right? And and uh, you know the the Egyptian government. I mean, I know many people in the Egyptian government, including the president, and and uh, and, and and wish him the best with his wide range of reform efforts that he's undertaking. But when I look at Egyptian recent history in particular. Uh, under under Mubarak, Mubarak uh, you know, consolidated power by really eliminating what he saw as potential political rivals, and therefore drove any rivals underground. And that underground organization uh, was was dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood, for example. Uh, when when Morsi took power, he did the same thing, right? When trying to to re rewrite the constitution, uh, he resisted any effort to move toward a pluralistic political environment. Uh, and and, uh, and 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 an evolution toward representative government, and it, my my main concern is with Egypt because as the ambassador said, it's one fourth of the Arab world, and if there's a problem in Egypt, I mean even a small problem in Egypt is a big problem based on scale. Uh, I, I, are there concerns about about how Egypt is evolving politically? What more could be done uh, to avoid a repeat of this cycle, in which the the whoever's in power squelches opposition to the degree that it drives it underground and 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 those that are most organized uh in, 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 uh, in opposition to the government uh are muslim brotherhood type organizations that are that are destabilizing the region so i think political reform u.s support for political reform in a friendly way in a participative way not in a directive way uh i think is also an important aspect of what u.s policy should be toward the region but Ambassador, I'd love to hear your comments on, you know, what comes next politically in the region to, to set a foundation for greater security and stability long-term and development long-term. Th thank you, General. Uh, and, and you raised some points that I think we will get to because they uh, also uh, dovetail with a lot of the questions uh, we re we've received from participants beforehand and a lot of questions I'm seeing uh, on the chat. Um, so I appreciate all of the participants who did send in questions. There are too many uh, to uh, really get to uh, one by one. So I will synthesize the questions uh, for, for both speakers uh, very briefly. And I appreciate, of course, the brevity of your response so we could get to as many as possible. Um, a question to General McMaster. Uh, well, there have been a number of questions uh, about this issue of U.S. disengagement from the region um, under the title of the pivot to Asia, under the title of di disengaging from uh, the Middle East. And you, you laid a very powerful argument that there are costs to, to that disengagement. Um, what do you say to the counter argument that 
goes like this, that yes, there are costs, but the costs seem to outweigh the benefits. There are no longer the, the tangible uh, national security interests from the United States uh, in the region, and that US strategic interests lie elsewhere, lie in Asia, uh, lie in South America. I mean, the, the, these are the regions that see, that are witnessing the fastest uh, economic growth. These are now uh, the centers of global investment, global trade, global technology. What stakes do the United States still have uh, in the region to outweigh or to, change, to maintain this cost benefit analysis for the United States? The general is muted. Yeah, no, no, I have it. I have it. So, so what, what, are the, what are the arguments? If you're over 50, you have to be reminded to unmute yourself at least once during a Zoom event. So the, but the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the argument, as you mentioned, for disengagement is, hey, you know, we're not dependent on the Middle East for oil anymore. The U.S. is the largest oil producer in the world and the U.S. is exporting oil. And so it doesn't really matter anymore. Well, of course, the Middle East does matter for the free flow of natural of resources and goods. You know, because it's critical to the global economy, right? And we, we saw that with the, you know, the Suez Canal uh, crisis and so forth. And we've seen that with even just minor disruptions in, in, the, in the global energy um, uh, supply uh, associated with the, the, our pipeline in the Eastern United States, for, for example. So, and we see this with Iran still using the flow of energy for course of purposes with attacks on tankers and so forth. So it's, it's still important for that reason. But I think really the, the importance is that is that first of all, you know, as I mentioned, just when you think it can't get worse in the Middle East, it actually can. And disengagement can actually make a bad situation worse. We, we've seen this obviously with the Syrian civil war, the unenforced red line. Think about the resources that Europe and the United States have poured into the humanitarian crisis in Syria. And what could they have done earlier with a no-fly zone, with safe zones, for example, in northern and eastern portions of Syria? Similar to the, green, to the green line in, in Iraq after the 1991 Gulf War and how that, how that protected the Kurdish population there and led to a really vibrant, uh, a, a vibrant uh, society uh, and, and significant economic growth and, and, and educational improvements and so forth uh, in, in that region of Iraq today. So I, anyway, I just think that it, it can get worse. And, the, and then also the, the issue of jihadist terrorist organizations, right? I mean, when we disengaged from Iraq in December 2011, President Biden said to President Obama, thank you for allowing me to end this goddamn war. That's what he said on the phone to President Obama. Well, think about how self-referential that is. Wars don't end when one party leaves. And Al-Qaeda in Iraq didn't look around and said, oh, hey, the Americans are gone. I guess we'll just stop. Right? In fact, they morphed into, into the most destructive terrorist organization in history. ISIS, which took control of territory the size of Britain, shot down a Russian airliner, uh, and then and then and then directed and conducted multiple attacks in Europe, inspired attacks in the United States. Right. So so the problems don't don't go away. And as I mentioned, there, there's the humanitarian. But finally, what I'll say for those who say pivot away from the Middle East and go to and go to Asia, the, the competition that is most relevant in Asia is with a Chinese Communist Party that is promoting its authoritarian mercantilist model. And the Middle East is one of those arenas of competition. So disengaging from the Middle East actually does not help. It actually cuts against the competition with, with China's authoritarian uh, mercantilist model as well. And hey, I'll just say, by the way, we always say we're leaving, but we never really leave. And so what happens right. is, and so what happens is we give up all the benefits right, associated with sustained engagement. And we encourage our friends in the region to hedge against our departure. And in hedging against our departure, they actually empower our adversaries. So it, it's, it, it's, it's, not, it, it's counterproductive uh, in so many different, so many ways to say we're going to disengage from the Middle East. Thank you. Yeah, I think that aligns with what Minister Fahmi says, that when you say you're disengagement and engaging and don't disengage, you, you get the worst of, of all worlds. Um, th thank you, General. Um, Minister Fahmi, um, a large number of questions on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, now, the Arab-Israeli conflict has returned uh, to the headlines uh, with, of course, the recent armed uh, conflict in, in Gaza between Hamas uh, and Israel. Um, th there was a time when the Arab region 
looked to the United States uh, as a, a serious partner in making peace uh, in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Given everything that's gone on uh, under the Trump administration with the deal of the century, and, and given what we see or, or seem to perceive as the, the lack of enthusiasm on the part of the Biden administration for actually investing the political capital uh, to resolve this problem, um, how should the Arab world engage with the United States when it comes to the peace process? Uh, thank you, Karim. Let me, if I may, just quickly answer the, the, the general's question first uh, on reform. Uh, in my previous comments, I mentioned that one of the weaknesses of the Arab world was resistance to change. Uh, I also referred to the youth factor. Youth, uh, maybe only David is young enough to remember youth, but uh, they always want more and they always want it now and they always want to engage themselves. That's really, these are imperative needs for the Arab world. Uh, if we don't solve that ourselves, we're going to face problems in the future. I'm a big supporter for more reform. Now the debate has been, if you have security problems, and we do, do you open up on the politics or do you wait until uh, the, the uh, security is resolved? I don't think in global environment in today's network society that uh, and in the pace that the world ex exists in today, that you have the choice of either or. You need to do both gradually uh, and ensure that the transition is, is normal. So I'm all for that. And that's why I said in my comments, don't try to make me American, just try to make me a better Egyptian. I would focus American support on capacity building in every possible way. And you will see that generating uh, the reform process internally much more effectively than being lectured to when you feel it's good to be lectured to and then forget about it when you don't feel it's good to be lectured to because it costs you too much uh, to pay the price for that. So again, I don't like to be lectured to, but I'm happy to accept your, your support and make me a better Egyptian in the way I uh, want to, and you may not like my stubbornness after that, but then democracy is not an easy uh, process, including in international relations. On the question you raised, Kerry, uh, you know, I'm not a big supporter of the deal of the century. I never was because it was inconsistent with a true two-state solution. Uh, clearly this administration, the Biden administration, felt that there's no real need to engage in peace process, and I think it still does, uh, that it wants to deal in a long-term ceasefire. I don't believe in long-term ceasefire if the anger exists. Uh, but I really don't believe that the problem is in America per se, because America has never led the peace process, except in one circumstance, when George Bush Sr. Uh, and the Russians pushed the Madrid peace process. Everything else was driven by the region and America came on board uh, afterwards. So as an Arab, uh, I would work on three or four tracks at the same time. One, one has to deal with the humanitarian, human normative part of this. You can't violate people's rights of prayer and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, destroying their houses and so on, as we saw from the Israelis in, in Jerusalem. Uh, secondly, yes, there was bombarding from both sides across Gaza, but when you target civilian buildings, when you have 60, 60 uh, women and children uh, killed, uh, as much as I also regret the civilian lives uh, lost in Israel, there's no comparative, a comparative uh, uh, if you want position here. So I would hold anybody on either side responsible for violations of human uh, laws of war and human rights. Secondly, I would uh, want to ensure that the tenets of the peace process are preserved. In other words, it's about ending occupation and, uh, and giving everybody the right to live in security, including the Israelis, and recognition. Uh, that's what the ball game is about. It's really about finding a solution based on the 67 border. There's no other solution. 
And I would say, let's safeguard these and reaffirm them because I don't think presently Israeli politics in Israel are conducive to a two-state solution. If I did, I would argue, let's get the Americans on board and let them push this forward. The Americans won't push it forward because it's not for them a winning dimension. Uh, if the Israelis were to change domestically, I think the Americans would be happy to engage as they, they did in the past. Uh, so I would not, frankly, depend on America on the peace process in the short term, but I keep them involved. Uh, I would emphasize, I take the initiative as an Arab on the humanitarian, the legal, the political uh, part of it. I'd ask America, okay, put your, put your as, as they recently said, reestablish the constant in Jerusalem and announce that you support a Palestinian state based on the 67 borders with the capital in East Jerusalem as a state recognizing Israel to live in peace and security at the, at the same time. Do these steps. Ultimately, uh, this will put positive pressure on all the parties and it will make those wanting to pursue peace, not wanting to pursue only ceasefires and then postponing the process, uh, the real uh, leaders in, as, we, as we move forward. But again, we all, it's easy to blame the big powers for everything. I think the real problem here is uh, from the region and we need to take it back to the region. Uh, thank hey, you. Can I, can I just uh, offer a few, a, a few, co a few comments uh, just quickly? Please. You know, the United States does provide a, about $70 billion of assistance to, uh, to Egypt every year. That's just to Egypt, right? Uh, and just if you think about uh, U.S. assistance across the whole region, it's, it's massive. Uh, I would just say to the ambassador's point, it doesn't make sense for the United States to do that if they think that that assistance is not inconsistent with U.S. interests. And, and if that's the case, uh, I mean, if U.S. comes to that conclusion, it's mainly for political reasons. So I think I agree with the ambassador, right, that the United States should not come in and try to dictate, you know, reforms or anything. But I think it's unrealistic to ask the taxpayer, American taxpayers, to provide that kind of assistance if they think that assistance is not is not beneficial, right, to the to the Egyptian people or to people in the region. That's not the case with it, with our aid to Egypt, I believe. And this is, of course, a foreign military uh, foreign military funds, but but the economic support funds in particular that support uh, you know healthcare and good governance and so forth. So I, I think I think Americans recognize that you know that they. I mean, this is again another example when we say we're leaving the Middle East. Okay, when, when you're providing seventy billion dollars of assistance here, you're not leaving, right? You're not leaving the Middle East. And the, the other thing I would just say is that on the Abraham Accords, I don't understand, Ambassador, your skepticism about it. How could it not be a good thing, right? Because as you mentioned, the internal dynamics inside out working on the Palestinian-Israeli issue set, it, it's a futile endeavor right now, not only because of Israeli politics, which you mentioned, but because of Palestinian politics and the weakness of the Palestinian Authority, the strength of Hamas. And and uh, and so I, I, you know, I, I think that that working on it from the outside in to provide incentives that over time, over time could uh, you know, could could convince the parties uh, that it is in all of their interest to resolve this conflict with some form of, of a two state solution, right? And and you know that's not in the offing now. Uh, I, I think because of 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 legitimate, but the fragmentation of Israeli politics, the movement of Israeli politics to the right, that's all that's all correct. But it's also the, it's the problems within the Palestinian Authority, the weakness there, the strength of Hamas and Israel, who ceded Gaza to uh, to the Palestinians and then saw it taken over by Hamas, fears the repeat of that same thing in the West Bank. Right. So that's kind of a legitimate concern, I think, on the part of the Israelis. Um, and so as Israel faces this dilemma to these days of either giving up its status as a democratic uh, Jewish state. Uh, I, I think, uh, or uh, if it goes to like a one-state solution, uh, or or pursuing it to, as two-state solution uh, at a time when it, it security concerns can't be addressed, the Palestinians are in an even worse situation. I think, with a corrupt Palestinian Authority, with many people who are invested in the status quo because they make money off it, and so, and I think my Egyptian friends, most of them who are in government, they agree with all of this. I don't know any of my Egyptian friends who are pro-Hamas, right? And I think if ultimately, if you're pro-Palestinian, you have to be anti-Hamas, right? So 
Um, anyway, I just wanted to provide some of those comments because I think that was a rich uh, set of comments you made and wanted to respond to those. Thank you, General. Can, uh, can, can I jump in? Me. Yes, please. Just, just, just quickly. I don't think we differ that much, although we differ a little bit. Uh, my comment about the deal of the century was not on the Abraham Accords per se. It was on the whole map that was drawn out and what needed to be done, for, because I don't think that took into account the Palestinian opinion enough. Uh, I actually told my colleagues in the Gulf who signed the accords and my Palestinian colleagues at the same time, you guys differ on sequence, on sequence, but you both want to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. So rather than fighting with each other, why don't you work with the third party, the Israelis, and see how we can move uh, this forward. And that's frankly why uh, in my previous comment about the ceasefire in Gaza, uh, of course we have, Egypt has problems with, with Hamas. Our relationship with Hamas is security. How do we secure the border? How do we deal with the crisis and so on? Uh, and I was the ambassador in Washington when Hamas threw out the Palestinian Authority and my Israeli colleague said, are you going to talk to Hamas? I said, yeah. And he said, what do you mean? I said, we're going to talk to them about security because there's a border, but we're not going to support them politically. We support the PA, the Palestinian Authority. Now, that's exactly why what I'm saying is that if you have a long-term ceasefire, then the quote unquote, for lack of a better term, winners from this appear to be the Israeli right and the Palestinian right. But if you try to, to, push, to build on the ceasefire with a peace process, then you're going back to the centrists on both sides to try to achieve peace. So we don't differ uh, that much. Uh, although, again, I don't think that the Abraham Accords convinced the Israelis not to do what they did in Gaza either, sorry, in, in, uh, in Jerusalem either. And one last point, when they withdrew from Gaza, I had talked to Shimon Peres before that, many, many years before that. And he said, uh, Gaza is the only place where Arabs and Israelis want to leave. And when they left from Gaza, they expanded settlements in the West Bank. So they didn't leave out of Gaza to give them uh, liberation and they still control all the exits in, in Gaza as well, except for the one with Egypt. Anyway, I'm all for trying to pursue peace. I, that's important for us to move forward because I want what I think America wants, a centrist, moderate Middle East. Unmute me. Yeah, th uh, thank you both. Uh, I realize we've come uh, to the end of our allotted time. Uh, and I think that this has been a very rich discussion that would maybe uh, compel us uh, to invite both of you gentlemen uh, for a follow-up to this conversation. <laughs> Um, but if maybe I, I could um, beg the indulgence of our organizers just to take a, a, a few extra minutes to ask uh, a final question uh, to both speakers. Um, so it, it's really striking in this conversation how the agenda of the old US-Arab relationship still remains very relevant. I mean, here we are talking about regional security. Here we are talking about Arab-Israeli peace. Here we are talking about energy, um, but it, it seems to me that given all the changes, can we think of a new agenda for US-Arab uh, cooperation that doesn't displace the old, but broadens the scope of the issues that we engage with? Can we think of climate change, for example? Can we think of resource scarcity? I mean, it's very striking that now the United States is involved in a very direct way in negotiating a solution to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. So that, can we talk about these issues? Can we talk about technology cooperation, capacity building, uh, as Minister Fahmy uh, mentioned, to deal with the challenges of the 21st century? So that we're not just uh, stuck talking about the old agenda of, Arab, of uh, US Arab cooperation, but broadening the horizon of the issues of cooperation. If I could ask the general uh, to start first. Yeah, I th what a great question. Thank you for asking. So I think it's it's the program that you have going is one, is one part of the solution. It's worth noting, okay, that 
that more than half of the population in the, in the Arab world is below the age of 25, right? And so I think that in and of itself represents tremendous potential. And, and I think that, uh, that, that what we can do to, to, to tap into that potential, first of all, is stress our common humanity. What we have in common, so much of the discourse today in the United States, right? But internationally, is it emphasizes our differences, right? Hey, let's talk maybe about, how our, co- about our common humanity and what we all want, which is to build a better future for generations to come in each of the areas that you've mentioned. And so I think, of course, the Middle East has a lot of problems, right? But I'll, I'll tell you, you know, when you have you know, more than half of the population under the age of 25, that's a lot of potential also, right? So, so I think that's maybe how we could change the discourse and, and, uh, and move forward, not only just in one particular area that you mentioned, energy security and how that relates to global warming and climate, but, but a whole range of issues that we can work on together. Thank you. Minister Fahmy? Thank you, Karim. Let me try to give you a, a concrete answer. Uh, but with an anecdote, a quick anecdote. When, when I was ambassador in Washington, I noticed that 40% of the Egyptian cabinet had American university degrees. Uh, and an even larger number of them had taken advantage of the Fulbright fellowships that existed before that, which you don't provide presently. Uh, your soft power is extremely attractive to everybody. And it's also a wonderful tool to help define the mindset towards moderation centers as we move forward. That's my first point. Pour in assets in that area and you'll help us become better at what we do. And that will have a long-term effect on us and on you as well. The other point I'd throw out and that I always like to be self-critical. I would like to see an Arab write out a crude plan for what he'd like to see in the Middle East in the future. How they'd like to deal with the future of the Middle East. Be that, as you mentioned, environmental issues, water issues, uh, resource issues. Let Arabs lay out the plan. And frankly, if we do that, I'm sure that the industrialized world, in particularly the US, but the industrialized world will find more, I mean, the general made an excellent point, the support will come if, if they find a rational reason to provide the support. Uh, the world wants to know where this difficult Middle Eastern region wants to go. And unless we provide them with a logical answer, it doesn't have to be a consensus, by the way. If we have 10 plans for the future and the industrialized world decides to support eight of them, everybody gains. So we need to lay out the plan, not only about war and peace, war and peace will always be there, but uh, also about building the region towards the future and then reaching out. uh, And I'm sure our uh, wealthier colleagues, be they from the region or from beyond, will find reason to invest in that future. Uh, Thank you uh, to both of you gentlemen for uh, a really uh, insightful and candid uh, discussion Um, As was mentioned at the beginning of uh, this conversation, uh, this is really meant to be the start of an ongoing series of uh, conversations, uh, debates, and reflections on uh, the U.S.-Arab relationship. And on behalf of the American University in Cairo, we very much look forward to our partnership with UCF uh, in that regard. So uh, we hope to see many of you in our future conversations. And I think in that context, we may be calling on both of you gentlemen for a round two uh, of this discussion. Uh, So thank you both again. Uh, David, uh, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, you you said it all, Kareem. Thank you, uh, General McMaster, and thank you, Ambassador Fahmy, as always. This is a great start to our discussion. We look forward to uh, to you all participating in our future event. We'll keep you posted. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks. Thank you.